sort of an honor to stand here again. I appreciate and admire you very much. And of all the places my wife and I have ever lived, we've met more genuine, wholesome, loving, encouraging Christians in this congregation than any place we've ever been. We cherish that more than we could ever say. I'm thankful for the assignment of this lesson, the restoration plea, in this great lectureship that's been planned. I look forward to reading the book. If I were to choose only one verse to discuss the restoration plea, it would be 1 Peter 4.11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. That's the basic thrust of New Testament Christianity. Preach the word urgently. 2 Timothy 4 verse 2. Speak the things which befit sound doctrine. Titus 2 verse 1. As Micaiah, the noble prophet of Old Testament lore, stated, As the Lord liveth and speaketh unto me, that will I say. 1 Kings 22, 14. From a prison cell in Rome under despotic Nero, Paul said, I am set for the defense of the gospel. Philippians 1, verses 16 and 17. The clarion call and the distinct term of Jude 3 rings out. Contend earnestly for the faith, once for all time delivered unto the saints. And thus the motto of the restoration plea should always be, let us go forward back to the Bible. In Christianity, if it's new, it isn't true, and if it's true, it isn't new. It's at least 1,900 years old. We skip Constantinople and Rome and go all the way back to Jerusalem, Acts chapter 2, the day it all began, for New Testament Christianity and all of its pristine beauty. There is a statement from Jeremiah, my all-time favorite Old Testament character, that fits here perfectly. Jeremiah 51:50, let Jerusalem come into your minds. In Psalm 77, 5, the psalmist said, consider the days of old. Proverbs 22, 28, remove not the ancient landmarks which our fathers are set. And more to the point than that even, Hosea 5, 10, leave the landmarks alone. And when it comes to spiritual matters, we need to keep them where they were placed long ago by divine inspiration and by heavenly oversight. In Jeremiah 6, 16, we're told to stand in the way and seek the old paths. Wherein is the good way and walk therein, but they said we will not walk therein. In 1 Kings 12, 28, an evil man named Jeroboam who was so wicked that about 30 times after he died when men did ungodly things, it was said in a proverbial statement, they walked in the way of Jeroboam who made Israel to sin. What heinous statement did Jeroboam make? We've gone up to Jerusalem long enough. In other words, we've obeyed God as long as we're going to. And from that came the divided kingdom that led to anarchy and rebellion and ultimately to 70 years in captivity because they had earned it, they had deserved it. There are some precious passages that are very straightforward that set the tone for our study. Now you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you, the famous utterance of Christ in John 15, 3. For the seed of the kingdom is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, Matthew 4, 4. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away, Jesus proclaimed in Matthew 24, 35. For the scripture cannot be broken, John 10, 35. Notice the ultimate respect they had for Holy Scripture. Isaiah 50, 5, 11 is a bulwark statement. I'm still working on that book. The great uh, chapters of the Bible, the great questions of the Bible, the sweetest verses, the saddest verses, the sternest verses, and now I have a section on the blockbuster verses of the Bible. And uh, it'll be 14,000 pages long when we get through with it. But Isaiah 55, 11 will be at the top of the list of the blockbuster verses. God said, my word shall not return to me void. It shall accomplish that for which I have sent it. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1, 21. And the restoration plea is a plea for getting back to the Bible and all the Bible all the time without qualification, apology, or equivocation. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, furnished completely unto every good work. And right after that he said, I charge thee in the sight of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick of the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. 
The restoration plea is based upon totally that sacred text of which Jesus said to the apostles, I'll teach you how and what to say. Matthew 10, 19. Which things also we speak. Not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. 1 Corinthians 2, 13. In light of all these passages, Brother Taylor could not have led a grander song than the one that preceded our lesson. Holy Book Divine. Precious treasure mine. Light to my feet, a light to my path. Yes, it guides us now and will sustain us in the final accounting day and throughout all eternity. Thus, we're not to go beyond the things that are written. 1 Corinthians 4, 6. We're not to go beyond the doctrine of Christ, nor bid God speed to those who do. 2 John verses 9 through 11. And if I were to choose an Old Testament theme song that undergirds everything we'll say, it'd be Proverbs 7 verse 2. Keep my commandments and live, and my law is the apple of thine eye. Psalm 119 verse 63 sets forth the Bible basis for unity, which was the number one plea of the restoration movement over a century and a half ago. It defines Bible fellowship better than any other verse I know. Psalm 119 verse 63, I am a companion of all them that fear thee, and of them which keep thy precepts. We're to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Recently in Abilene, the brother spoke on Ephesians 4, 3 and spoke of the Spirit of unity. That's not the unity of the Spirit. There's a lot of difference in that. The unity of the Spirit is the unity the Holy Spirit provides through the Word. He guided the apostles into all truth. John 16, 13. We're sanctified by His truth. God's Word, John 17, 17. And it's the truth that makes us free as we continue in the Word of God. John 8, 31 and 32. There's one body and one spirit, even as you're called and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. For the same preached on the possibility of apostasy. He said he had just scratched the surface. Well, he scratched it real well, I thought, from Matthew through Revelation. That was at least a good introduction. We appreciate it very much because it sets the groundwork for the restoration plea. Since men are apostatized, departed from, left the moorings of the gospel system, we need to get back to the original stance, the territory of pristine Christianity that begins in Acts chapter 2 and will be culminated in the judgment day. But there are problems in the restoration plea today, and they are based upon the same basic attitude problems that go all the way back to Genesis chapter 11, where the people at the Tower of Babel said, let us make a name for ourselves. I believe that's one of our basic problems right now in the church of the Lord. People are trying to make a name for themselves. Later in Numbers 14:4, the people said, let us make us a captain to lead us back to Egypt. And when men first want a captain, it won't be long till they ask for a king. And Joshua predicted that the moment they turned away from God, who had blessed them with 50 years of conquest in Canaan, to serve the nations round about them, they'd go again into captivity. And sure enough, in the days of Samuel, at the culmination of the degrading era of time known as the period of the judges, where every man did that which was right in his own eyes, Judges 17, 6, and Judges 21, 25, sure enough, the people said, Give us a king that we may be like the nations round about us. Some years ago, I was rereading and restudying the book of Ezekiel to write some material on it. And lo and behold, in Exodus 20, verse 32, I found out why they were in captivity and why Ezekiel had to work so hard to get just a remnant of them. Ezekiel chapter 36, to repent so Abraham's seed could be restored so the Savior could come to bless the world. Genesis 22:18. 18. Right there in Ezekiel 20, verse 32, we find what the problem was. The people said, we will be like the heathen. And sure enough, they were. They dressed like them, worshiped like them, committed idolatry like they did, and they spent 70 years with them too. Oh, how we need to get out of that and go back to the original stance of Christianity. But another problem we share with an infamous character in the Old Testament, King Saul, is the statement he made in 1 Samuel 15, verses 23 and 24. After told to obey his better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams, he honestly admitted, I feared the people and obeyed their voice. 
There is the aura of apostasy coming over the horizon. I feared the people and obeyed their voice. In Luke 6, 26, Jesus said, Woe unto you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers unto the false prophets. I want to share with you four stanzas in the song of apostasy. Matthew 7, verses 15 and 16. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, There will be false prophets among you. In Matthew 24, 24, as he predicted what would happen between that date and the year 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed, in that 40-year period of time in the first century, he said, even false Christs shall arise. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, as he lists the great suffering he endured as a servant of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 29, he said, I was in perils of false brethren. And in Revelation 2.2, 2, the Lord said there were false apostles in Ephesus which had been proved false. False prophets, false Christs, false brethren, false apostles. No wonder apostasy fomented. <coughs> there are many passages that tell us what to do about it and how to recognize such error. So the restoration plea will have validity. Romans 10, 1 to 3, Paul said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. A critique on our modern civilization, even within the body of Christ. In Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end there are with the ways of death. For every way of man is right in his own eyes, Proverbs 21, 2. And I didn't realize how much of this heresy, this error of going by one's own feelings had accommodated itself in the body of Christ until I listened to a national television broadcast our brethren had several years ago when I was in Springfield in a meeting out in the country. That was a place where they didn't mind Bible preaching. But I got up that morning and turned on the television to see if I could pick up any gospel preaching. And I saw three men seated in chairs having a nice little chat, spending about $150,000 of the Lord's money. And for nine minutes, I watched them as they discussed things, and their conclusion was always, it seems to me, or I have a feeling, or the consensus of thought on that is, and I waited nine minutes to hear one verse of Scripture. I never heard it. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. In 2 Corinthians 3, 5, our sufficiency is not of ourselves, but of God. 2 Corinthians 10, 18, not he that commendeth himself is approved before God, but whom the Lord commendeth. And the most familiar verse of all, you've already expected this one, Jeremiah 10, 23. O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself, it is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. We're far from the restoration plea when we try to establish something by what other people are doing or what brethren deem wise. What does the Bible say? That's the only possible thing to consider. Deuteronomy 12.8 rebukes men whose mentality causes them to follow our brilliance instead of divine revelation. Deuteronomy 12.8 says, Ye shall not do after all the things that we do here this day, every man that which is right in his own eyes. And 2 Peter 2.1 said, There were false prophets among the people, even as there should be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. But the same referred to Acts 2, 37 to 42. Our brother referred to some of this as he made comments at the Lord's table. And how that brought back fond memories to the table talks we had in Australia and the spiritual power that can be had when we stop and meditate and don't rush through the Lord's Supper in memory of the death of him who left heaven and came to earth and suffered and bled and died that we might leave earth and go to heaven. I wish more brethren took more time for the Lord's Supper. But Acts 2.42 is the clarion call of the restoration plea. They continued steadfastly, not haphazardly, not spasmodically, not off again, on again. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching, in fellowship, in breaking of bread and prayers. I've heard many a sermon on worship through the years that emphasize we must worship properly as we praise God in song. 
We must worship God properly as we give of our means. We must worship God properly as we pray. And on and on, and properly in the Lord's Supper. But I haven't heard many sermons on proper worship in that which we listen to from the pulpit. Do we have a right to just hear anything that he wants to say? Must it not be sound doctrine for the worship to be sound? I talked to any number of brethren in metropolitan areas who don't have much choice concerning faithful New Testament congregations who say, well, I attend a congregation I'm not very pleased with. Sometimes they'll say I'm not very proud of. Uh, and I really don't go along with some of the preaching and teaching, but every time they sit there in the assembly, they go along with it. What if they said we won't have the Lord's Supper today? Would they do anything about that? Or they said we'll have instrumental music to accompany our praise service today. Would they do anything about that? Right then, I want to tell you something. It makes a difference what's preached from the pulpit if we're going to be honest and honorable with the restoration plea. It must be God's holy word. Preach straight forward without apology. Yes, the truth in love. Ephesians 4.15, as our brother prayed. And oh, how we need that. Love for God. Love for truth. Love for the souls of men who are listening. Love for the sanctity and purity of Christianity. Love for lost mankind. The restoration plea means that we have to get back to the following points. And brethren, I believe we must be balanced. And that may be the key to a lot of the preaching that we need to analyze and scrutinize. Is it balanced? Is it covering all the ground that bolsters and backs up the integrity of the restoration plea? I believe the number one point of the restoration plea must always mean that we go back to the sovereignty of God to his absolute power, to his sublime authority. He ruleth by his power forever, Psalm 66, 7. God is our refuge and strength, Psalm 46, 1. God rules in the kingdoms of men, Daniel 4, 25. And if everyone who preached and every elder who would oversee the flock believed in the sovereignty of God, it would be demanded that the word of God be preached over and over and over again. God's sovereignty is the basis of the entire Bible, the first statement of the Bible. In the beginning, God. Jehovah reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. Psalm 93, 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Psalm 24, 1. Now someone may wonder what that has to do with the restoration plea. I'm convinced that men who preach very little Bible and who have a lot of time for Dodson and Swindoll and people who are not even New Testament Christians and spend 30 or 50 percent of all their sermon extolling the power of philosophers and psychologists and uh, human counselors instead of preaching the Word of God do not have a proper view of the basic number one fundamental of the restoration plea and that's back to the sovereign power of God and there's not but one way we can know about that power and that's in the Bible that's how he's revealed himself Therefore, congregations that major in minors, and by that I mean philosophy and psychology and humanism and good manners and etiquette and social poise and graces, but have just a little bitty bit of Bible, haven't gotten back to the restoration plea. It begins with the sovereignty of God. And then it goes to the authority of Jesus Christ. Just before he went back to heaven, he emphasized in Matthew 28, 18, that he had all authority in heaven and in earth. Brethren, put a sign up out front that says the Church of Christ meets here. They've just challenged themselves to be honest. That means the people who meet at this place belong to the Lord, are subjected to His authority, and gladly so. And thus, in the Church of the Lord, not in the building, but in the assembly, in the work and worship of these people who belong to the Lord, we'll have a thus saith the Lord for what we stand for, and never apologize for it. If we really respect the authority of Christ, we'll have very little difficulty knowing where we ought to stand and what we ought to teach. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers of the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Keep your gaze permanently fixed on him, Hebrews 12, verse 2. But we see Jesus, Hebrews 2.9. They turned and saw only Jesus, Matthew 17.8. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, God said. Hear ye him, Matthew 17, 5. I'm really not too impressed with what anybody said other than Christ. He's the head of the church, the king of the kingdom. 
the Savior, Redeemer, and friend of man, the Master Teacher, one sent from God. And he came from heaven to do the Father's will, John 6, 38. And he glorified God upon the earth, having finished that which God gave him to do, John 17, 4. And on the cross he cried, it is finished, John 19, 30. And some of the preaching and teaching and emphasis that is seen and heard and known from many congregations is of an uncertain sound instead of a Christ-centered, authoritative sound. The restoration plea depends upon the sovereignty of God, the authority of Christ, the sanctity of the Bible. The 119th Psalm says in various verses, I'll not be ashamed to speak of thy word before kings. Forever, O Lord, is thy word established in the heavens. O how I love by thy law. It is my meditation all the day. The entrance of thy word giveth light. I stand in all thy word. I will meditate upon thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy law. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. Oh, how we need to get back to the restoration plea built upon the sovereignty of God, the authority of Christ, the sanctity of the Bible, and the spirit of humility and service. There's an area we definitely need to improve in. We still have some restoring to do in that area. Christianity is not a religion of the elite that are carried around on silver platters and catered to. They're servants of Almighty God who humbly, gladly serve Jesus Christ according to His will. Jesus said, I did not come Open to be controls. served but to serve and to give my life a ransom for all, Mark 10, 45. He girded Himself with a towel and washed the apostles' feet, John chapter 13. And Peter learned a lesson that day and years later wrote, inspired by the Holy Spirit, gird yourselves with humility, 1 Peter 5, 5. And if we claim to be New Testament Christians and we have not the spirit of humility and service, we have forgotten the Bible says, he that exalts himself should be humbled, Luke 14, 11. And humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up, James 4, 10. And I might say on behalf of all of us who are visiting here today, we thank you, the members of this congregation in advance, for your spirit of humility and service, for the plans have already gone into housing and feeding and caring for your guests, your renowned around the brotherhood, for your generous spirit of humility and service. And yet, we could all do more than we have done. Sadly, in most congregations of this size, you have about no more than 30% that really engage in the service activities. I know what I preached here sometimes, we would have uh, uh, a big number on Sunday morning in the assembly, and then when we talked about personal work or the elders call for workers, we didn't have quite that many show up. So we all need to develop in the restoration plea, the spirit of humility and service. But if I were to cite the number one feature from a human standpoint of what the restoration plea involves, it would be love for the truth. Did you listen carefully to our brother's prayer this morning? Clay, as he mentioned, the attitude we should always have for truth. To not only teach the truth in love, but to have respect for it and intend to obey it. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we read of the heart and core of apostasy in the first century. And do you know the major conclusion of why they apostatized? They received not a love of the truth that they might be saved. They had pleasure in unrighteousness. And when men do not love the truth, and all the truth all the time, apostasy is lurking around the corner. For convenience has always been the mother of apostasy. And the line of least resistance makes crooked rivers and sorry members of the church also. Proverbs 23, 23 says, Buy the truth and sell it not. And Jeremiah cried, We're strong in the land, but not for truth. Jeremiah 9, 3. I still believe one of the greatest statements ever made was Emerson's statement concerning truth. It is man's perdition to be safe when for the truth... He ought to die. And Aristotle said of his dearest friend and mentor, Plato, Plato is dear to me, but dearer still is truth. And when that isn't true of each of us, we've forgotten the restoration plea and are cooperating with apostasy. Under the restoration plea, here are some things we must not do. You were beginning to wonder if I was going to get around to that part of my character. Here are some things we must not do. We must not exalt men. I'm not a camelite, a stone eyed, a new light, or an old light, or a camelite, or anything else. I'm just trying to be a Christian. 
I do appreciate the courage and boldness of the pioneer preachers. And every time I catch an airplane in Dallas and I'm getting off the plane in Pittsburgh in less than three hours, within a 30 minute uh, drive of where Alexander Campbell used to ride by horseback or ride on a stagecoach or walk to preaching arrangements, I realize what a great debt of gratitude we owe to men who love the truth enough to leave family and home and to walk and ride through terrible weather and many of them died because of illness they contracted on such trips, but they preach the word. I admire them, I appreciate them. Jacob Kreef, J.W. McGarvey, men who love the truth and pointed men back to the truth. They weren't perfect. Some of those men we've mentioned taught some error. But at least they were noble in their devotion to getting New Testament Christianity before the people. And the plea they made was back to the Bible. But we must not exalt men. We must exalt Jesus Christ. We must not exalt our cherished tradition. It bothers me when brethren say we've always done it this way. And this is the way it's going to be. And they're talking about tradition and custom. Sort of like the old lady out in Odessa. She may still be standing there because we closed the service one time with a song instead of a prayer. I know she's standing there 10 or 15 minutes later waiting for the closing prayer. She thought, I was a heretic. I said, but in the book of Mark, we read they sang a hymn and went out. That wasn't good enough for her because that in the way Ma and Pa had always done it. One lady in my hometown wouldn't meet with the brethren at 2.30 on Sunday afternoon in the rented hall they had to have after the building burned down because she said, I'm not going to assemble any such unscriptural hours at. We must not cherish tradition. We not, must not be loyal to schools and papers and editors and leaders, but to Jesus Christ. I know some brethren, I believe, have to read a periodical of some name every Monday morning to find out what they're so, supposed to believe that week. We must not be loyal to that which man has engineered. It bothers me, for instance, right now there's a controversy in this area concerning a college, a university that's called a Christian school. And there's some people a lot more concerned and excited about comments against that school than they ever have been about comments made against the church of the Lord. And one is divine and the other is human. We can't have sacred cows we built ourselves. The restoration plea demands we go back to the Bible, back to the church you read about in the Bible. We also must not quit studying. And we think we've studied enough to arrive at everything we need to know, and we're just a little bit smarter probably than the Lord himself. We're in bad shape. The restoration plea demands that we constantly search the scriptures daily to see if these things be so. Acts 17, 11. Now, Believe it or not, we come to the conclusion, but don't reach for your songbooks yet. It's a long conclusion. It only has 13 points. Divide into three points under each point. Need to be through by 1.30, though, they tell me, to answer those questions. Incidentally, I don't need any more questions. I've got all now and say grace over, and maybe a few other words over. But anyway, we look forward to that. It's going to be interesting. And then I've got to make a quick getaway. I begin a meeting tonight in Cleburne at 7.30. They'll just wait for me. Now, the restoration plea. Here are some things we must not, dare not, compromise on if that plea would be legitimate. Number one, the name of Christ. There's salvation in none other name, Acts 4.12. It's that worthy name by which you're called, James 2, verse 7. They went forth for the sake of that name, 3 John, verse 7. Glorify God in that name, 1 Peter 4.16. What a privilege it is to be called a Christian, a Christian, one who wears the name of Christ. That's why you'll not hear us being loyal to Luther or Wesley or Calvin or Joseph Smith or Mary Baker Eddy. We must never compromise on the name of Christ. It bothers me when brethren do not like to be referred to as a church of Christ. Can you think of something better, more scriptural, more beneficial to the Spirit? Oh, to be a part of the church of the Lord. Our brother at the Lord's table read Philippians chapter 2 to center upon Christ. God gave him a name that's above every name. We must not compromise on the gospel of Christ. It's still God's power to save. Romans 1.16.
And if the gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. 2 Corinthians 4, 3. We've been put in trust with the gospel. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4. The glorious gospel of Christ. 1 Timothy 1, 11. We must not compromise on the gospel. And yet I hear more and more of the still small voice that tapped me on the shoulder and told me to do this and that. And I just know it was the leaning of the Lord. And we must not de-emphasize the gospel of Christ. We must not compromise on the church of Christ. Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades should not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 18. And God is glorified in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. That beautiful accolade of Ephesians 3, 21 thrills our soul. We must not compromise on the plan of salvation. I will never understand as long as I live why brethren are trying to get across the following point. How little can a man know and still become a Christian? That's the very opposite of Bible teaching. Why not teach how much should he know so he could really become a Christian? I'd like to know more, not less. The plan of salvation still reads the same way. Acts 8, 12, when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Colossians 2, 12 answers a lot of the heresy on the plan of salvation today. Buried with Christ in baptism, wherein also you're risen with him, through faith in the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. God has spoken concerning the plan of salvation and what it takes to obey the way of redemption, to become a Christian. We must never compromise on that, but preach it even more clearly. We must never, ever compromise on purity of life. And it's in this area that New Testament Christianity and the Restoration plea is suffering most, I believe, in our day. We've got more folk who would like to be called New Testament Christians that are living like, dressing like, talking like, acting like the world and still want to be a Christian. We had better get back to the sanctity and purity of Titus 2.12 and live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. For without holiness, no one shall see the Lord. Hebrews 12, verse 15. We also must never compromise on the purpose for existence. Philippians 1.21 says, For to me to live is Christ. We live for Christ. Christianity is not a way of life. It is life. And we must never compromise on the hope of heaven. Have you noticed in the last few years fewer articles written, fewer sermons preached on heaven and hell? I believe it's a part of our materialistic, humanistic society to de-emphasize the supernal, the sublime, the eternal, the everlasting, the glory that awaits the child of God. But Titus 1 verse 2 still reads, In hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before the world began. And we have this hope as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. As Jesus entered the Holy of Holies, heaven itself, so shall we follow our forerunner there. We must never compromise on these things, things for which we plead. I close with several passages from Jeremiah that are as fervent and rich and vital and pertinent now as they were six centuries before Christ. Jeremiah 8 9. Where are the wise? They are not wise if they know not the word of God. His words were found, and I did eat them, and they were the rejoicing of my heart. Jeremiah 15, 16. Where is the word of the Lord? Jeremiah 17, 15. It should be in the pulpits and in the classrooms. And wherever we go as servants of the Lord, his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and could not contain. Jeremiah 20, verse 9. O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Jeremiah 22, 29. Is not his word like a fire and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Jeremiah 23, 29. Is there any word from the Lord? An evil ruler asked in Jeremiah 37, 17. Jeremiah said, yes, there is, but you're not going to like it. The ruler said, tell me what it is. And Jeremiah told him the word of God, and sure enough, the ruler didn't like it. And we've got to preach it when they like it and when they don't. In season, out of season. The restoration plea demands it. What? saith the scriptures. Romans 4 verse 3. And no better place to stop than with Luke 24 32. When Jesus walked no more with the two men on the road to Emmaus. They turned to one another and said, Did not our hearts burn within us? When he opened unto us the scriptures and talked with us by the way. The restoration plea in the heart of scripture without apology, without equivocation, 
and that always. Polycarp was burned at the stake in Smyrna in the year 155 for being a Christian, for standing up for these things we've mentioned. His captors gave him an opportunity to be released and to live if he would just denounce Christianity, deny the Lord. And that aged Christian said, Eighty and six years have I served the Lord, and he has never forsaken me. Shall I forsake him now? No, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. That's the restoration plea. May God help us to stand for it regardless of the outcome. One day we can walk the golden street of glory with the redeemed of all ages and with faithful preachers and elders and brethren through the years who lived and died for truth. Before we stand to sing this song of exhortation, let us bow for a word of prayer. Almighty sovereign God, through the blessed name of Christ we come, grateful for the restoration plea, grateful for the beauty and simplicity and power of New Testament Christianity. Grateful we can call thee our Father. Father, help us to be loyal and faithful and true and steadfast and strong for things divine and never back off because of heresy, apostasy, enmity, rebellion, compromise. But may we stand strong and tall for truth. We're grateful for the revelation of thy will and for the possibility of being thy people. May we rise to the occasion and let the whole wide world know we're not ashamed of the gospel, thy power to save. Use us to thy glory. Help us to keep the church pure and noble, aggressive and strong. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. There are those in this assembly who are not members of the church of the Lord. The day it all began, though. From the churches of... Living room app. Accessories and scenes you add in the living room. Music recognition. Selected. Screen.